Hi everyone, I'm absolutely over the moon to reach a thousand subscribers. I couldn't have done it without you. Uh, thank you so much for everyone that's taken interest in the channel. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that people are relating to my journey and um, a lot of people have been asking on the channel about my journey and my story and, and our story as to how we've got here. Uh, I've got my wife Louise with me and Leo and um, kind of just want to give you an insight into our journey and how we came over to the States and, and what we've been through to get over here. Can you give us a few words, talk to us a little bit about the inspiration behind the YouTube channel? Um, the time that you're putting into it you know obviously there's 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 a lot of benefits to it and, and it's a unique perspective for some people so can you give us kind of how the idea started and, and where you're where you're seeing things as they stand now yeah so I kind of had a hobby of just looking at YouTube videos you know whether it's whether it's watching football games whether it's highlights of certain players motivational videos fitness videos and I guess I just sort of saw a niche in the market where no one's doing this sort of thing you know no one's given an insight into the life of a footballer um, there's ups, there's downs, and I want to, I guess, bring people along my journey and, and give them an insight into what it's like of the life behind the scenes. Um, and I've been so happy and of how, how receptive people have been and how supportive everyone's been of the channel. And to see it grow so quickly, and, and I'm hoping that it continues to grow, is, is phenomenal. So Jack, let's start from the beginning. Okay, we'll work, we'll work from the beginning. Um, academy, club career. Uh, where it all started for you with football and then we'll move on from there. So I was at Nottingham Forest Academy uh, from being nine years of age. Uh, the academy structure is very different to how it is over here. Um, I was doing my schooling alongside the academy. Um, I would go to train twice a week, sometimes three times a week, and then I'd have a game on a Sunday. And that would be from the age of nine up until the age of 17 uh, where I turned professional uh, at Nottingham Forest. So your first professional contract you signed with Nottingham, how long were you at Forest and, and what was that experience like? So I got to the age of, well I actually left conventional schooling at the age of 14 um, to go into like a one-on-one -on -one tuition program uh, that, was, that was paid for by Forest and it was, it was fairly unique at the time, you know, no one was doing that sort of thing. Basically what it allowed me to do was to, to train uh, with people in the youth team that were three, four years older than me but also wrap my tuition around that so that I was able to learn, get the education that I needed, but then also um, progress my career. So it would also give me a plan B, not just to shoot for the stars um, and you know go all in and not have a, a backup plan. You know, It allowed me to have a backup plan, but still going for my dreams. And that progressed me as a player hugely um, in the three or four years that I was there. And then that, in my opinion, enabled me to turn professional when I was 17. So that time obviously was really important uh, for you and your development. What was the next step? Where did, where did you go moving from Forest and, and your education? You could well, talk a little bit about that. Well, my education, I sort of, um, I had some unique experiences at that period of time. So 14, 15, 16, I was able to go to foreign clubs uh, abroad. So I was able to go to Brescia in Italy. I went to Deportivo La Coruña in Spain. Uh, I went to Atletico Madrid in Spain and then also AZ Alkmaar in Holland and basically what I would do is I would go over and train with, with their academy for a week, two weeks, experience what it was like over there and then almost report back to Forest and it would help me, it would also help the club to you know, give an insight into what it's like in, in other academies and at the time everything I was doing was extremely unique, um, I'd, never, I'd never experienced it and no one in the academy had before so it was sort of creating my own path and and it helped the club a lot as well and to develop their academy program. And then uh, when I was, I would say 16 years of age, I met Lou. Uh, Lou was working in the Forest Club shop. So when she was 18, I was 16, um, we sort of met that way, didn't we? Yeah, we did. <laughs> okay, so for Lou, Lou, talk about what it was like at Forest for you and, and your first impressions of Jack. How did you meet him? And, <laughs> and what did you think of him on and off the field, actually? We'd love to hear a little bit of what you thought of his football. In all honesty, we don't really remember meeting, it was so long ago. I'd just started working at the club, Jack was playing there. We must have met either in the club shop or on a night out probably. <laughs> um, we were kind of on and off for a little bit and then we reconnected three years ago. That was when it was serious. <laughs> um, on the pitch he's always been great, I always kept track of him. Always his number one fangirl I guess. <laughs> So 
So talk a little bit about what it's like to be with a professional footballer. You know, it's a unique lifestyle and, and, it, and it offers fresh challenges and interesting challenges in a relationship. What, the, what has that been like for you? And now you have a young family with Stan and Leo. <laughs> um, it's hard. It's a lot harder than people realize. People think football is glitz and glamour and they don't see the difficult side of it. Um, obviously in England it's slightly different when you have away games they get on a coach drive a couple of hours they're back the same day obviously in America it's a lot different they're away three days um, so it can be hard especially when you move to a new city you don't have your family and friends around you and even more so when you've got kids like we have the little one now and just adjusting to being on your own a little bit until you get your network of friends going um, it can be tough but at the same time, it's exciting going to new cities all the time. It's exciting to watch him go and live his dream, really. And what led to your departure and, and how all that kind of came about? So we um, we had a fantastic youth team there. So I was there from nine, went turned professional at 17, and we had a fantastic youth team there. We had a great youth cup run, um, and there were some fantastic players in that group. So I was lucky to play and be around and immersed in an environment where it was quality players, quality coaching, and you really taught the game from, from a young age very well. The sad thing was with the club was that there was, it was like a revolving door for managers. You know, we had something like eight managers in three years. And um, I guess that was extremely difficult as a young player to come through. You know, you try and impress as much as you can and then as soon as the manager gets sacked, it's almost like you fall to the bottom of the ladder again. So that can be very difficult. Um, I came towards the end of my, of my time at Forest. I, uh, I suffered like a, a broken leg, so I had a stress fracture in my fibula. Um, I was at a period of time where Stuart Pearce was the manager, the you know the legend that, that that was the player at Forest, and he came in as manager, and I impressed. I did did very well whilst he was there, and then unfortunately, you know, part of the downsides of football, it comes with the territory, is you get a bad injury and it can set you back. Um, had some complications with the the injury, and I was out for maybe five months. In that period of time, Stuart Pearce got sacked and a new manager came in and I guess they weren't fully aware of, you know, of um, they didn't know me as a player. I didn't never work with them before and I suppose it was a decision that they make that, that they don't give me a contract. At the time it was heartbreaking because it was a club that I'd, you know, I'd been involved in from nine years of age and all I wanted to do was play for Nottingham Forest and come through the first team and wanted to be club captain, all these dreams and aspirations. And I guess when it comes to an end so abruptly, it's like, what do you do? Um, and I think that was the catalyst to, that meant that I wanted to do something completely unique. And I guess that's where my grandparents come in, um, in Arizona. They'd been there 30 years and they have a house there. They had really set up there. And so I used that as a base to travel. So I um, flew out to the States uh, on my own, left Lou at home. Uh, and I guess the goal was to, to, to get a contract in America. Um, I didn't know what level, um, I, didn't, I didn't know what standard it was going to be at, but I knew that I had the capabilities of, of being a player and um, I was confident that I could get one. So I ended up getting a, a one-way ticket um, with, with the, the goal to, to get a contract. Ended up um, meeting a guy called Barry Venison, um, who was working at Orange County at the time. Uh, ex-player in England and he really he really took to me he really liked me uh, and he got me an opportunity to, to train with Minnesota uh, because he knew the manager Carl Craig and um, I guess it, it just went from there really went on trial flew up to Minnesota I had never been in such a cold environment in my life um, everything was new that was extremely difficult for us you know it was um, we'd been together probably a year and a half at the time so it was a big jump for us to, to, to sort of come apart and for me to go on and try and get a contract and sort of go into the unknown. And um, I guess I impressed, did well, got a contract at Minnesota and the rest is history. So as an international player, obviously there's different rules and regulations every country you go. Could you touch on a little bit what it's like being an international player in America, uh, the number of spots teams are allowed to have and how that's affected uh, your career? Yeah, so when I came out to Minnesota, obviously I'm, I was completely unaware of any rules, you know, regarding MLS, regarding international roster spots, and it was sort of just something that had to be explained to me. I had no idea of uh, anything, any of these rules, and so to find out that you're restricted to seven spots per squad, 
is extremely difficult, you know, because you've gone from a wide spectrum of trying to get in a roster of maybe 25 to now only narrow it down to seven. Then you have to sort of be better than, um, you know, to, to get into that small number of, of players, you have to be better than other people. And I guess because there's less spots, there's more competition. I think Minnesota was difficult because I came into it halfway through the season, maybe like a third of the way through the season. And the club knew they were going to MLS already. And so it was it was difficult because the club wasn't nece necessarily stable. Even though it was it had stability higher up, it didn't have stability where it was in the NESL. And so I guess for um, for a player to to try and get into the MLS as an international, especially at the age of I think I was 20, 21, 22 at the time, um, is difficult. So um, uh, that's why I was, was not given a contract by Minnesota to go into the MLS, um, which I understood at the time. I, I didn't necessarily expect to. I just wanted to try and perform to try and get a contract elsewhere. Um, and that's when Jacksonville came calling. And um, again, the season that I had last year and winning Young Player of the Year is, uh, sort of set me up. So talk to us a little bit about you know Jack had a great season in Jacksonville and and you guys you guys had had a had some time there and then you've transitioned to the Rowdies you know uh, it's no secret things got a little bit complicated in that time can you give us from your perspective um, you know it puts strain on a relationship but you can talk even a little bit about how it brought you guys closer even. Yeah so well, we loved last year in Jacksonville Jack had a great great year for his career we made some really good friends club were really good to us um, yeah it was great we really loved it um, things towards the end of the year and the start of this year got quite messy as a lot of people know um, with the league and the club but it happens um, but we believe everything happens for a reason and we ended up moving down to Tampa for him for a permanent deal and I mean we love it even more here you can't not love it here yeah I think as well the difficulty that there is for for Lou's perspective as well is that ever since we've come to the States uh, when it's time for Minnesota it was um, we moved to Jacksonville and then we moved again uh, down to Tampa you know every year we've moved cities and that can be quite difficult as well you know experiencing a new city especially without friends you know you're exploring and I guess it brings our relationship closer and stronger because we rely on each other and um, it, it, it gets tough because you feel alone like it's just you two but then you meet new people every year, you meet um, incredible people that, that you, you don't realise that they become lifelong friends and um, this city and this club, the Rowdies, has been absolutely phenomenal with us and they've, they've really understood um, our, our story and, and really understood uh, where we want to go and our aspirations. You talk about being new parents for the first time. I mean, that's obviously it's hard you to put in one. words, but uh, yeah, maybe we re we go to Lou for it a little bit. What it's like to be a first time um, mother, a first time father, especially in another country. Right. Scary. Yeah, <laughs> Scary for the fact that uh, I think we were probably under a lot of stress. I think that was probably one of the main reasons he came early. Um, Scary the fact that he was in intensive care for a long time, but at the same time, it's so amazing. You can't you can't put into words how you feel after like your first child. Any child is born. Um, we love him more than anything, and uh, it's I mean it's hard with not having our family here. Obviously, normally you'd have your family and friends rallying around you, but it's good that we've met great people here that are willing to help and willing to do anything they can for us. And we have family coming over every few weeks really to visit us. We've got a jam-packed year with people. Um, but yeah, we wouldn't change anything for the world. Yeah, I agree. It's just the feeling you have, you can't explain. Um, you feel like you have a new purpose and you want to bring him up in an environment that, that is perfect. And I guess everything that the aspirations and dreams that we have are only personified by that. And um, yeah, you, you can't put into words how you feel. Some people in, in the states they're familiar with the, with kind of the shift in the soccer landscape with the, the professional leagues. You know, initially there was the MLS, the NASL, and the USL. Um, the NASL, which you were a part of last year, is uh, is now no longer operating. Can you touch a little bit from a player's perspective what it's like to have a league um, that folds and then to change leagues? Um, how that's affected you and, and what you saw during that time? Yeah, I mean it's it's widely documented across the country. You know the the instability of the of the system over here. I think we first we first experienced it after my year at Minnesota. So after the 2016 season, 
uh, I knew that Jacksonville wanted to sign me. Um, I knew that they were interested and they said to me, look, we're offering you the contract, we're offering you this, um, but we've got to wait for the league to be sanctioned and given the opportunity to run in 2017. You know, I'd never experienced anything like that before, you know, to have um, a league, a, a team that's ready to go, but not necessarily a league to play in is like, it's crazy to me, but that's the system over here. And we first experienced that back in England, we were told, you know, we go back to England every December. So in the off season, we'll go back and we'll see family, but to have the instability at the time and not know whether or not we were actually flying back out to the States was difficult. So to experience the, the 2016, uh, 2017 off season, you know, where we didn't actually know if we were going to fly out to Jacksonville, um, to even start a new team. That was sort of a taste as to what was gonna come. So they were sanctioned, luckily they were sanctioned, so got the contract, we flew out to Armada. Um, obviously the season went fantastic for me. Um, we had probably the best year we've, we've ever had um, off the field. You know, we got engaged, uh, we got married, we found out we were, we were having him. I guess everything sort of fell into place and it was a fantastic year, you know, I'd say it was the best year of my life and um, to then experience another situation which was 10 times worse, 10 times more severe for us. Um, so I'd left Armada, sorry, I'd, I'd had a good year with Armada and I was told at the end of the year, we're going to offer you a new contract, we're going to offer you a three year contract. Um, give you stability, I'm going to give you the green card, you know, we'll get that process started. But again, we've got to wait for the league. This time it was more severe because Lou was six, seven months pregnant at the time. So we went back to England and again, we didn't know what was going to happen. You know, we had apartments set up, ready to go to move in. Um, everything was sort of up in the air. but. It was different to last time because this time off the field there's way more severity in our situation. We were told still fly out to Jacksonville, let's you know, let's go as if the league's happening, you know. I guess it was difficult for the people in charge at Armada because they didn't know what was happening. They were being told different things every day as we were. So for a, this is another thing as an insight into the life behind the scenes is that it's it can be so unstable. And you know, it's not like a regular job where you know your hours, you know where you work, you go to work every day. You know, sometimes it can be in different countries, different continents, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy when you think about it. Um, but I guess that's where I respect Lou so much for the fact that she supports everything I do and everywhere we go and it's, it changes every year. And luckily for us, things have got better every single year and things have worked out, but it was an incredible, incredibly stressful period of time. Um, I think that's probably the hardest thing we've ever been through is uh, having a nice time back in England for Christmas with the family, kind of being excited for the next next year and next season and then to come back and everything be up in the air and all of a sudden you have no idea where Jack's going to play, where we're going to live, where we're going to have our baby. It was a, a really tough time for us. So it came to January time and we flew back out to Jacksonville to try and get the situation sorted and to try and resolve what was going on as much as we could from a player's point of view. Um, so I flew out and at the time Lou was seven months pregnant, so he was two months away from giving birth. And so it got to the point where I rang the technical director of Armada and I said, you need to tell me what's happening because it's getting serious for us. You know, we're due to move into a new apartment in Jacksonville, we've got a year lease on it. You know, yes, I've got the three year contract and the stability of the money, but at the same time, I want to further my career and I want to keep it on the same path from having such a good year the year before. And so um, he told me, well, we don't know what's happening. I wouldn't move into your apartment. And I guess as soon as he told me that, it was sort of alarm bells were going off in my head and I knew that I had to get a change. So I spoke to my agent at the time and said, I need, I need something different, I need either a move completely or a loan. I knew that because I had the green card in the contract that it would be difficult to replicate that elsewhere. So what happened was I said, are the Rowdies interested? Because logistically it would be perfect, but not even logistically, but just as a club and as the reputation they have, I just questioned him. I said, can you speak to them and see if they would be interested? He got back to me like 
half an hour and said yes they're interested as soon as i heard that i was like wow like that's phenomenal um sort of um massively thankful straight away that they were interested and they came back so quickly and they said that yes because of the green card and the contract and stuff it would be better for a loan for both clubs so let's do the loan so at that time it was probably the end of january um probably probably no it was middle of january wasn't it yeah but the middle of january where i i knew i was going on loan to tampa and that the deal was getting processed and then out of the blue, this little man decides to, to, to <laughs> cause havoc and decided he wanted out. So it was literally five days before we were due to get in a U-Haul and move everything down, is that Lou went into labor. And I mean, there's no, it's not a coincidence that the amount of stress she was under was the reason she went into labor so early. Um, so at that time, everything else sort of just stops around and you just completely focus on your family and making sure that first of all is that she's okay and that also he's going to be okay and for him to be born six and a half weeks premature is never easy you know in, in any situation but especially the situation where we didn't have a house at the time and to, to be technically homeless and Lou in, in, in labour and it's just I can't put into words like the stress we were under and how well she did and he did to, to get out of the situation. You I mean, said um, you said Leo wanted out. Um, at which point did the whole situation between Jacksonville and Tampa uh, move to? Was it a situation where you wanted out as well, or, or from your perspective, um, being in the middle of that? How did I that guess like um, as soon as the Armada president told me that not to move into my apartment that was the moment i wanted out not out from the club because it was a bad club you know it wasn't like i was in a situation where i wanted out because everyone had, had um, annoyed me or everyone had you know I, it wasn't like i was on bad terms with the club and i wanted out it was literally the situation that the, the league was in and the the players in the in the team and everyone was was in the same boat it was it was just the instability and for me at the time and my family it was impossible for us to go into a situation where there's no league and there's no team for me to play in um, and so I guess I wanted out Leo wanted out Leo was the only one that was wanting in to be honest <laughs> so, yeah it was but to be honest from from the get-go as soon as I spoke to Lee Cohen at the Rowdies um, you know the general manager here and then I also had a conversation with Stu Campbell from the moment I spoke to them they've been nothing but supportive you know they said to me take as long as you need we know that he's premature we know he's in the hospital don't rush to come down like we're starting pre-season February the 1st but don't come down you know we want you to stay up there and look after your family and for me that was just a quick insight as to what it's like in this club you know to have such um, nice people really working in the club um, and understanding people in a, in, a, in a sport and a scenario that can be extremely ruthless to have that and to have to have people looking after you was exactly what we needed at that point. Um, so obviously you came over from the UK. Um, can you give us a little bit of insight of what it's like? I'm sure growing up, you've, you've probably spent plenty of Saturdays watching a guy like Joe Cole compete for some of the top clubs in England and some of the top clubs in Europe. Um, what's it like to share a locker room with a guy like him or a guy like Neil Collins who've kind of come over from the UK and placed a little bit of a trail for you guys to, to follow behind? It's very surreal. Like, it's, it's, it's surreal to be in the same dressing room as them, you know. Uh, someone like Joe, who I watched at the World Cup, um, his goal against Sweden, I was in my living room in England celebrating with my family that goal. I was probably only 10, 12 years of age. Sorry to, sorry to make Joe feel old. But, um, yeah, it was, it's incredible. It's really surreal. And, and ever since I've come through the door, and with Lou as well, they've been so welcoming. You know, as experienced players, they've welcomed us in as a family. They've welcomed me as a player. And I guess the reason that I find myself in a good position in the team and, and playing good, playing well is, is, is that reason, really, because people have welcomed me and, um, I guess, made me feel at ease. And that's allowed me to perform. And um, to have players like that in the locker room is is fantastic. Just to kind of conclude and wrap wrap up a little bit, can you talk about what, what you're looking forward to the rest of the 2018 season, your expectations from 
from a team and an individual standpoint and then uh, from a standpoint of your of your budding family and as you guys continue to grow i think that um as a as a team standpoint i think that we have more, we're more than capable of going on and becoming the usl champions i think the squad we have is fantastic you know the depth of squad i think that's important as well to have the depth of squad where you know because it's inevitable we're going to pick up injuries we're going to pick up touch wood doesn't happen but it's inevitable it's going to happen and you know to have the depth of squad that we have i think that will that will set us in good stone for the the rest of the season um i think that the coaching staff are fantastic they've got uh way you know they've got enough experience and knowledge of the game to set us up every week to to go out and perform and to to do well um so i think from a team standpoint it's it's extremely exciting um from a club standpoint and the fans and everything you know it's they've they've really welcomed me into the team and welcomed me into the club and i guess the the support of the fans is phenomenal you know to have that here and the players feel it you know the players feel the support from the fans and to have our home stadium as like a fortress and to you know hopefully our goal is to try and become unbeaten at home and um you know i guess that's that's the target as a team Individually, I'd like to just progress and learn every day like I'm doing from the more experienced players um, and become a better player. And if I can pick some goals, some assists and some starts and appearances along the way, then that's fantastic. But my goal is to just become a better player and hopefully reach that next step, which is MLS. And from a league standpoint, the USL, I've been extremely impressed with, with the professionalism as a league. The people that work in the league, you know, they've brought me in and had a really good conversation with them about my YouTube channel and connecting with the USL and how can we do something where we're, we're both working for each other and I guess that's where the Blake down came into it and they came to me with the idea of you know analyzing the goals of the week and plays of the week and involving me in their their sort of media their media side which is which has given me a lot of exposure as well for my YouTube channel which is fantastic um, and I think that as a league itself, with the NESL fold, folding, a lot of the quality players that that are in the NESL have come across to the USL, and you see it across the country. You know the USL teams are a lot stronger this year, and I think the, competi the competition is is harder, which again can only be good for the league and the longevity of the system in in the US. So I think that you can look at it both ways. Um, yes, the NESL negatively affected players when it folded, and families and coaches and a lot of people don't see that, but from a USL standpoint, I think it's only strength in the league.